Welcome inside episode 506 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains. And the Sens lost last night 5 2 after scoring the two opening goals. We'll put a final bow on that one, but excitement is already returning based on this morning's practice. The Senators get a massive boost to their lineup. And what kind of impact will this boost have in an upcoming game against the Florida Panthers? We'll talk about that. And the Belleville Senators are on the road up against the Hartford Wolf Pack tonight. Preview of that game and a Sen Central citizen. Graham joins us to discuss his love for the Ottawa Senators, how he deals with his dad being a Leafs fan, and a whole lot more. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. Your team every day. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Wednesday, March 2nd in Pilsy. The Ottawa Senators have their first line center back. Josh Norris back at practice, not wearing a yellow jersey, but a regular one. He's back on the top power play unit for practice. And yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, there he is looking good in red. And it is so nice to have this team's leading goal scorer back after watching a long stretch of a team that is great at keeping pucks out of their net, Ross. Not so great at putting them in the other team's net. So you're saying it's good to get a guy who's on pace for a 41 goal season if you had t- done it for a full 82 games? That's that's actually good. I'll go out on a limb and say yes, that is good. This is this is huge. Not only we'll touch on what it means for the power play, but at even strength, this team was dying for goal scoring. Brady Kachuk and all the haters saying he's overpaid. He's just missing his best friend who's been out since January. 27th that's how long it's been without Josh Norris in the lineup he's missed upwards of 18 games and they need him back and playing the way he was before this was a guy who was snapping back 55 percent of his draws for most of the season he was helping get facilitate on even strength with Brady Kachuk and even when Drake went down I know it was only like a game or two that he played before he ultimately got injured so it was just kind of a chain reaction from that sense. They really didn't even have time to figure out life without Drake. But getting Josh back in the mix here, it can't be understated. How huge this is for the confidence and demeanor with a team that's going through the flu bug. All of a sudden, they've only got three wins in their last 10 games. This is a team that needs an emotional boost. And we talked about getting Whitey back. That's big. This is 10 times bigger getting Josh Norris into the fold. Absolutely. And yeah, you look at the center depth now and you've got Norris, Stutzla, White and Gambrell. That's that's looking up nicely. Like that's what we want to see here. And I think a big part of it too, Ross, is obviously everything you mentioned, getting Josh Norris back specifically does a lot, but it also helps shift responsibilities down. Now, Tim Stutzla doesn't need to be the guy that's going up against the big matchups. Now, Carl Mark White. Up. Bark and only his tomorrow. second game. Yeah, I, that's a big one for sure. Colin White, only two games in, and he's had to really step it up and like hit the ground running in the regular season. So I think getting Josh Norris back, it just slots everyone in a much more uh, appropriate spot in the lineup, and I think that's going to pay dividends for everyone. And not only are we seeing the return of Josh Norris, we're seeing the reuniting of a line that had great chemistry early on this season if you're watching on youtube we've got the ottawa senators practice lines pulled up right now i'll run through them pilsy we obviously already touched on the impact that josh norris makes and i still want to talk about the power play but first let's stay at even strength i want to get your biggest takeaway from what's four five six changes to the lineup there's lots going on so here it is josh norris centering brady kachuk and zach sanford the second line is tim stutzla between alex formanton and Connor Brown, the third line, Colin White between Nick Paul and Tyler Ennis, and Gambrell between Kelly and Watson. On defense, Thomas Shabbat with Nikita Zaitsev, Nick Holden with Artem Zub, and Dylan Hetherington with Victor Mete, leaving Eric Brandstrom 
as the extra defenseman. He was practicing with the extra forward, Adam Gaudet. Both Murray and Anton Forsberg accounted for a practice. Pilsy, what's your biggest takeaway? We should also mention Chris Tierney, Josh Brown, not at practice. Yep, that's a good roundup right there. And my biggest takeaway is the smallest player is not on uh, on any line rushes. Eric Brandstrom out of the game here. And it looks like Dylan Hetherington is going to take his spot uh, with uh, Victor Mete, which... You know, I, I guess if you're if you're looking at Josh Brown being out, you're not really too pleased if you're DJ Smith about trying to trot out Branstrom and Mete as a line. And Hetherington's been up for a couple days now. Maybe you want to get him in during this busy stretch of back to back is coming up here. But if you're Eric Branstrom, a bit of a tough night last night too. It's tough seeing that uh, you're the odd man out here. Yeah, it certainly is. You'd still like to see him play over Victor Mete, don't you? Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like you you would hope that if you're looking for a small puck moving defenseman that Branstrom is the guy, not Victor Mete. But this could be uh let's give let's give him a break kind of thing or who knows, maybe Eric Branstrom was one of those players affected by the flu bug and still going through it. Yeah, we should wait and find out because they said it's affecting upwards of 10 guys. So yes. I was quick to point out and DJ Smith is talking to the media right now. And he is saying, so we'll wait and we'll give you any updates if he does mention Eric Branstrom. But Branstrom had his chance in the power play unit. The second unit couldn't do anything. Even when Shabbat was out, he moved up to the first unit. This is a power play that's gone four for 42 since the injury to Josh Norris. So do you think it's as simple as plugging in Josh Norris to his spot at the top of the left faceoff circle for this power play to get back to clicking? like it was in early January. I think it helps Ross, but you're still missing one major piece and that's Drake Batherson. Because sure, with Josh Norris there, you get your trigger man there. But with Drake Batherson and Josh Norris there, Batherson is a shoot and pass threat. So that allows Norris to have that space because they can't just cheat on Norris and cover him for that one timer. Because if they do that, well, hey, Drake Batherson, he's pretty decent with his shot himself, and you're just opening up space for him to utilize that. So I think, obviously, it helps having him back, but this won't be full strength without Drake Batherson. Like, he's he's the, the grease that lets everything run smoothly on that power play unit because no one, he opens up so many options. So obviously, it's great to have Norris back, but we're still not there yet. Where do you think he'll make the biggest impact tomorrow? And maybe we we should pump the brakes a touch. He hasn't played in over a month. Yes. So, Kay, it's not like he's going to come back here and score four goals in his return or anything like that. But do you think he means, means more to this team on the power play or at even strength right now? Power play, for sure. Because, look, this power play, it hasn't had a lot of success. But there was times where they had sustained pressure and they're getting shots on net and they're getting looks and cycling the puck. But... Who cares? That's just all child's play if you can't finish. And without Norris, you can't finish. So I'm going to say it's going to be a bigger impact on the power play, especially Ross with the shoulder injury. Who knows how much he's going to be effective in the faceoff dot right away. Maybe that takes a bit of time. Yeah, I hope not because he was doing so well, right? Like the game he got injured, it's still early. So I'm going to, I'm going to let him off the hook. For that one, but in the games before that, like you have to go all the way back to the game against the Islanders. Remember that second half of back to back against uh, against them. Like every single game after that, I'll run through it real quick. Except he had one really bad night against Washington, two for sixteen. Outside of that one, he was sixty three percent, sixty five percent, sixty six, fifty three, sixty seventy. 50, 66, those are all extremely good numbers in the dot. And this is a team that's in the bottom third, maybe even the bottom 10 of, of face-off percentage this year. So that'll be a big boost there. He's, he pushes everybody back down. And for the first time this year, Josh Norris and Colin White playing in the same game had so much. And then Stutzel wasn't even at center the last time that Colin White and, and uh, Josh Norris were in the lineup. So they're still missing Shane Pinto. They're still missing Drake Batherson. But as a forward unit, I'm going to pull it up one more time because if you, for example, okay, say what you want, whether you want to keep Parker Kelly on the fourth line or move Zach Sanford there or move Zach Sanford for a pick, whatever. This with Drake Batherson, that's a forward core that you're starting to see, you know, what a decent looking team can be. 
Yeah, I would agree for sure, Ross. And especially if you get into a situation where Shane Pinto enters the lineup and then maybe, let's say, your third line is Paul, Pinto, and White. Like, that's a yeah. really good top nine unit. And you've got all mixes of guys that can contribute in different areas. And the pieces are here. It's just going to take some time for them to all be healthy together first and then to develop into a team that's ready to make a push for playoffs. Yes. Once again, we get into that conversation in our Send Central Citizen today where we discuss, like, is it better to just miss the playoffs one last time rather than, you know, getting in just to get your ass handed to you by a team like Tampa Bay or Florida? Now, the Senators, last time they played Florida, and we're going to preview that more on tomorrow's show, but they didn't have Barkov in the lineup. They were kind of going through COVID at the time. We had a 20-year-old goalie, albeit a very well-hyped one, probably the number one goalie prospect in hockey. And he got lit up for eight goals in that game. So there's there's going to be a, uh, I think, sense of pride for the Florida Panthers, the first place team in the division, to come out and spank the sense tomorrow, left, right, and center. But if you're Ottawa right now, you just have to be happy that you're getting Josh Norris back in the lineup. Now, DJ Smith also saying right now, Josh Brown, maintenance day today. The TSN 1200 guys said that he had a... Uh, shot block late in the game he was hobbling afterwards a little bit of a limp so i don't know if that has anything to do with it or what but maybe we see dylan hetherington tomorrow maybe we don't the last time we had full-on like verbal meme michael scott saying oh my god it's happening when branson was practicing as the seventh defenseman and then next thing you know he's quarterback in the second power play unit and doesn't miss a game. So I think we're going to hold the brakes on for the Eric Brandstrom discussion if he is in and out of the lineup. That's something that we can cover tomorrow on Locked On Senators. But we still have Belleville to get to. We still have a last couple notes. Again, we have the postcast after each and every Senders game. So if you want to get more in-depth on the game against Tampa, we recommend you go listen to that wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube where subscriptions and likes and all that, they go a long way for us. But... We've also got a Send Central Citizen, Pilsy. Great to get this back in the regular rotation. Yeah, we love hearing from the fans. And Ross, this was a bit of a weird one for us. A Send Central Citizen from Ottawa, where uh-huh. our team plays, on the same continent even? What? So I know. It was nice to bring it back home and have a, have an OG Ottawa guy like Graham here. So we're happy to have him. Absolutely. we got to keep mixing back to the yeah. nation's capital next Send Central Citizen, though, we're going back to England, where there is a hive of Senators fans yes. in the UK. So we love that. We also love Built Bars. Built Bars Ooh. are the best if you're looking for a health-conscious snack that tastes great. Now, we know this is the time of year here at the end of February, early March, where New Year's resolutions, huh, they start to slip away. But don't let that happen this year. I'm doing mine right because mine was to eat Built Bars. Whenever I wanted to reach for my favorite chocolates, no. I'm reaching for my new favorite chocolates. Oh, wait, no, it's actually a protein bar. I'm just so convinced myself that it is chocolate because all Built Bars are 100% covered in real chocolate. But these Built Bar Puffs are the new thing. You got to try it. The Coconut Marshmallow is my favorite. All Built Bars, 100% real chocolate and real health benefits. Low calorie, high protein. Replace your candy bars with these at Built.com. I'm pulling up on YouTube, Built. Dot com. You can even see our promo code LOCKED15 right there, Built.com. Scroll down to the chart, see for yourself just how delicious and healthy Built Bars are. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. Built Bars make them taste delicious first, then figure out how to make them healthy. Go see it for yourself. Get the mixed box of Built Bars at Built.com, promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your next order. All right, here's our Send Central citizen. It's Graham. All right, we now welcome on this week's Send Central citizen. We're going to Ottawa. I feel like it's been a long time since we've gone to the nation's capital for a Send Central citizen. We're welcoming on Graham Scott. You can follow him on Twitter at Sends Shul Healing underscore. Nice pun there. Graham, what's going on today? Welcome to Locked On Senators. Pleasure to be here, boys. It's been a while. I've been following you a lot and uh, just just happy to be here. Man, we're excited to have you on the show. Let's get right into how you became a Sens fan. Is it as easy as being from Ottawa? <laughs> well, uh, you know what? I I was born with a disadvantage of a, a father who was a Leaf fan. Mm. Uh, so I, I had to, you know, 
uh, <laughs> find my own way to the Sens, but obviously like growing up in, in Ottawa, it, it, it's hard to ignore the Sens. And uh, probably like what really got me hooked was that 2007 run. Oh yeah. You, you can't, you can't argue that. So like I, I, I went to, uh, to city hall and watched that, watch it on the big screen with everybody. Nice. And it was, it was a hoot. Um, but yeah, just like playing hockey in my youth, uh, like there's parallels there. So you, you always picture yourself. <laughs> Man, I, I was at, I was in high school at Lisger right behind city hall during that oh, year. So they, they had, they had the whole stage set up. They had the big screen TV coming down. Like I want to hear more about your experience there. Maybe for the younger fans who didn't get to go down and man, that was shoulder to shoulder action about like the entire lawn of city hall. eh? It was unreal. It felt like Blues Fest or something. Yep. For uh, people who don't know Blues Fest, it's this huge music concert in Ottawa. But like it's, it the it was just buzzing. Like the app, I haven't felt an atmosphere like that in a it, probably since. To be honest, like the 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 city was just unreal. Like it's right next to Sen's Mile too. Like I wasn't at the age where you know you could go bar hopping afterwards or anything like that. Yeah. But like it like literally everybody and their dog was talking about the Sens and it, it was just so nice because like before then we like we were consistently making the playoffs and stuff but you know we kind of had that that Leafs curse uh first round uh, knockout that type of thing so making it to the final there it was it was just unreal so growing up with the dad as a Leafs fan, what kind of uh, relationship is that? Like, do you guys have like a, a fun competitive relationship or it's like, a, I'm not angry with you, son. I'm just disappointed kind of relationship. Like what's the dynamic there? Oh, you get um, home from school. You got your Jersey <laughs> sitting in the garbage can. Like what the <laughs> hell's going on here? Yeah. You know, there, there were chirping, especially, uh, God, I, I remember that, uh, the Sens Leafs first first uh, round playoff where Laleem let in that just abysmal uh, uh, showing. But game seven, so, <laughs> game seven, there was uh, a lot of chirping then and like throughout the whole the whole uh, hockey watching process. But it, it it was out of love. It was out of love. I, as I grew, I got to I got to ch uh, chirp more and kind of found out the you know the the touchy spots. So. It, it was a lot of love, but it was definitely, it definitely got competitive. <laughs> nice. W would we see you two brawling at one of those St. Paddy's Day's games? I feel like it was four years in a row. <laughs> Sens and Leafs played on St. Paddy's Day. Everyone was just mangled, hammered, and there were the most fights I've ever seen in a hockey arena. Is that you and your old man? No, 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 no. <laughs> now, if he was a Habsen, maybe. But There you go. <laughs> Yeah, nice. and hey, ahead, at, at least uh, you didn't have to watch his team go very far in the playoffs, right? He had to watch the the Sens go all the way to the Cup Finals and then Conference Finals later on. Whereas you you just had to watch quickly and then it's off to the golf course, eh? Well, I always told him that you know, like uh, I, I'd love to see the Leafs do something in in color TV. You know, <laughs> he, yeah, he, no, I, I think he was around for for the Leafs. Uh, yeah, he was. He was around for the Leafs the uh, last last cup win and yeah, was living in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Let's live in Senators past, at least before we move on. We want to get yes. some takes on how you feel about the team today. But when you're joining the hardcore portion of the fan base, which you said is around 07, let's put Alfie on a pedestal as we all do. Who else jumps into your mind as guys that really made you fall in love with the team? Uh, I mean... Uh, Miller, obviously, he like heart and soul. The the guy just he, hard working and like he he's just like he he was a beast on the ice, but he was a teddy bear off the ice. The the stuff he did for the community in Ottawa and, and continues to do so, he's like it was unreal. But I have to say, like for me, the person that I wanted to be on the ice was Jason Spezza. Nice. You know that that flashy center uh i try to to limit my no look giveaways uh, <laughs> but, drop pass uh, on a breakaway type stuff yeah yeah exactly but um you know like you, you can't deny like the, the the man had moves 
he still does apparently too. He, it's too bad he's with the the last no. now. But yeah. but you know I get it I get it. But uh yeah probably Spez and, and Mueller. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, when you're looking at Jason Spezza, I think what goes underappreciated, I mean, he was a whipping boy for a little while, but the second highest points per game in Sens history, just behind oh, yeah. Danny Heatley. And I'm pretty sure if you did the math, Spezza is assisting on about 75% of Heatley's goals while he was 100%. here too. So a little tap on the shoulder there for, uh, for Jason Spezza. Now he moved on in 2014. And next year, you're like, okay, how are they going to do without Jason Spezza for the first time since the millennium, really, 2001 draft? Then we get the Hamburglar run, and it kind of <laughs> ushered in a new era of Sens hockey of Eric Carlson winning his second Norris Trophy that year as well. Did that reinvigorate you after a few down years before then? Oh, oh man, that Hamburger. Like, we've talked a lot of, like, you guys have talked a lot. Yeah, with Ham and coming back. Don't get Ross oh, started. Here we go. <laughs> You guys, you, you started something back in, in my stomach. You know, like <laughs> just, just the fire started burning again. Like I was going through flashbacks to just watching that like unravel. It was, it definitely had 2007 feels, but I would even say it got me even more excited than to that, like than our uh, Stanley Cup final. Like I, I don't even care that we, we didn't get to the, the finals. Just the fact that we, like, what was it, 22 straight wins? Uh, Ross has the record in great in his brain. What, for Hammond? 20? 21 and 2. There you go, fellas. You're learning. So, so you're starting You're starting with that. Then you're, get, you're going past the first and second round, and then you're in the Eastern Finals with this, the Pens, which at the time were, like, unbeatable. They were, they were the Tampa Bay of this year right and it's just like the fact that we had to go to double overtime in game seven oh boy. It, it was literally i i was i could not sit that whole game so it really it, yeah it definitely reinvigorated everything and just i i just felt a buzz around the city that we haven't felt in a, a very long time yeah only one goalie in nhl history minimum 20 games in a season has a better save percentage than Andrew Hammond's 941. And that was Jacques Plant in 1970. So, he I mean, pretty good, I hear it. He was all yeah, right. yeah, he was all right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, go ahead, Pelsky. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. So, Graham, being a guy that's born and raised in Ottawa, did you get a chance to get out to a lot of games? And do you have any specific, like, you know, maybe it's not monumental playoff moments or anything like that, but specific core memories from being at the game as a fan? Uh, that's well, uh, yeah, you, you, you don't grow up in Ottawa and, and be a Sens fan and not. So like, I remember my first Sens game. I think I was with, uh, uh, uh scouts. We, we all went to, uh, to the game and it was, a uh, a Jersey game and I got to see Brodeur play live and Brodeur was on a pedestal himself. Right. You know, he was, he was a legend and I, I was just in, I think we were in three hundreds, but I, I was like all in and i was at the point where i thought the the noise meter actually was real uh and yeah so the i, noise I hate to like, tell ah! you graham <laughs> not real like, yeah we're what? pumping it up this is sick <laughs> <laughs> i was like i did that yeah uh, when, seeing broder i think we lost like 2-1 or something like that but broder like seeing broder play against my sons it was unreal especially for like i was like a hockey crazy kid and having my first Sens game like that, it was just, it was so cool. So now we're in an era where the Sens are hoping to get back to those days when they beat Marty Broder in the playoffs to move on, ultimately making the finals that year where you jumped on full tilt. But now with this rebuild, are you confident? Like where's, where's your head at here as we're entering about the fifth season now where they're not making playoffs? I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I th- I agree with Dorian's where the core is here. The core is here. It just, okay. it, it's hard because uh, you, you don't want your team to, to rely on two or three guys to do all the scoring. And that's, that's the biggest thing for me. So I think I agree with everybody out there who's saying we need a top six winger. I, I think if we do, uh, if we get a big trade or big signing or something on the, this off season, I think, I'm pretty confident we can make the playoffs, whether it be 
a wild card or, or not next year. I, like it's been a, a, a crap year for us. I don't think we've yeah. had our, our, our main core group all season. Yeah, because Whitey was out before the year started yeah. and then Pinto got her five games in. So, I mean, it's kind of weird to call a 20-year-old a part of your core group. <laughs> yeah. but the, way, the way Pinto showed last year, he certainly earned himself oh. into the conversation in that one too. So, no, I hear you. And it's, it's difficult, but at the same time, like, is it almost better? And maybe this is a reactionary take as we're recording this after a 5-2 loss to the Tampa Bay Lightning. But if you make it into a wild card spot at this stage, you're getting four extra games, maybe five. This, this this team, as it stands right now, isn't ready to take on a Tampa Bay Lightning in a best of seven. So it, do you think it's almost better? Yeah, playoff experience, you have to wait out on one side. Or like, hey, when we make it, we want to be ready to at least push a team to six or seven games. Yeah, I'm definitely okay with these baby steps. Like, we're obviously better than last year. Like, uh I, I think we're just figuring our, 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 our stuff out. Like we, it, who's the oldest, like out of our core group, who's the oldest guy? Probably Maybe. Connor Brown, 27. If yeah, you want Brown to even count him as, as a core, I think I would, I, I, I think. I would like at, at this point. Hopefully. I, yeah. I, I hope he sticks around. <laughs> I mean, of like true for sure core, Shabbat's your oldest guy. And yeah, he's, true. he's, he's not that just old. Turned 24. He's not that old. Yeah, exactly. So like, if you look at past, uh, past uh, uh champions like they've got they've got had some young talent who moved up marinated a little bit you know i mean tampa's and, the perfect example of that right exactly exactly and uh, i'm looking at belleville and and the boys who are down there i i like i think we're going to be in a really really good spot next year i'd love to see some of the guys come up and, and you know Secondary scoring, I think, is is big, and and yeah, I, I think we're I think we'll be fine. So adding that top six forward, let's say it doesn't work out in free agency, and you have to go the route of a trade. Which one of the prospects do you think that has value? Let's say maybe first or second rounders of the past, or Venti Sokolov, Clevin, a Greg, all these guys. Of course, Sanderson's not going anywhere, but out of all the prospects, like who would you think? could be used as trade bait in one of those situations. Uh, oh. I know it's like picking your, <laughs> your least favorite son in a sense. It, it's so funny because we've been talking about this for maybe what, two months now, and I still don't yeah. have a full answer. Uh, <laughs> so I imagine mean, how Dorian feels. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. Kidding. I hate to say it, but I feel like Ridley Gregg. Yeah. Uh -oh. I, I, I'd love to keep him. Believe me, I'd love to keep him, but that's the guy other other teams are looking at. Yeah. And I mean, your center depth is looking pretty good now. If you look at Norris, Stutzla, Pinto. Yeah. Like, I, I don't see Greg as a fourth line center. Mm -hmm. no. he, he, he deserves to be three or second line. Mm -hmm. and, and I just. And you I, don't want to move him to the wing. Like, I don't think that no, makes sense no, either. I, I, I don't think he would do well. Like, he's a, he's a born center. He's like, he's like Stutzla where. He he's got the breakout. He's got the speed down the down the middle, and he can dish it out. He needs so. to get in the mix too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like the guy's a beauty. I I want to keep him so bad, but I feel like he's our best. He's our best uh, guy right now to find something. Like I think we could get somebody really good with Ridley. Oh yeah. Uh, a pick, and then they like throw in a, a vet somewhere, and then yeah, to somebody who's uh, looking for a push this year. Yeah, I, I certainly think outside of the 2022 first round pick that Greg is your most valuable, not Jake Sanderson prospect. And yeah, again, that's fair. just don't to repeat, my... do not yeah, touch don't... Jake Sanderson in the trade <laughs> conversation ever. Remember the guys from uh, there was like a Flyers website credit to them. They got a bunch of, of clicks for it. They said <laughs> Sanderson and Greg and a pick for Claude Giroux on an expiring contract like. Okay, dude. Hey, it worked. It worked. He got the anger clicks out of me. I probably opened it two oh, or yeah. three times. Um, so at the end of this season, Graham, we really appreciate you coming on. We got a couple more for you. My last one, though, is what would constitute a successful end of the season to you? What is whether it's an individual player that's working up or getting his feet wet at a higher role on the team or a team goal? What would constitute a successful final 30 or so games? 
Oh man, uh, I'd love to see Brady really get some points here, Re- really push and and get some 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 positives on there. Like uh, I, I know he's not. He, I would love to see some goals. Like I know he's he's getting rough and tough, especially last night. But to me, like uh, the real captain shit is talking the talk and walking the walk. And right now he's talking the talk, but I'd love to see a little bit more walk. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I woke up to a few mentions on our Twitter at Send Central saying that he's overpaid, overrated. And uh, I hate hearing that about a 22 year old who's still, again, like Michael, somebody. Mikey DeStefano from Locked On Leafs was, was chirping me saying that Michael Bunting's being more productive and he's still Calder eligible. It's like he's four years older than him and he's playing with two guys. But and he's is... got both of his line mates with him. Exactly. Bunting does, yeah. Yeah, and two guys who, I mean, Brady doesn't even know where Belleville is. Bunting played five years <laughs> in the minors. Now, when it comes to that, though, with an $8 million player, no matter what his age, do you feel, and I guess you do to an extent because you're saying you want to see a little more, do you feel like he should be able to drive offense a little bit more by himself, taking away the fact that both of his line mates have been out for such an extended period? I mean, yeah, you'd love to see that. Mm-hmm. When he's playing with Norris and, and Bath, like obviously those two are going to be driving the place. Yeah, it's, it's the, undeniable. Like, especially it's, Batherson. He's such like a puck on his stick kind of guy, and that fits Brady's game because exactly. I don't think we're ever going to see Brady, you know, take the puck up the wing, cut through the middle like Stutzla <laughs> does, and, you know, no. go outside in. That's just not his game, but no. that doesn't take away value. I think it's just mm-hmm. a separate style of player. Exactly, exactly. He's he's the grinder. He's the he's – the, He's a playmaker, whereas, uh, uh, you know, Norris is a sniper or whatever you want to call it. I shoot first center. Yeah. I'm try- trying to go back to my NHL, you know, 19 or whatever it was last Break- night. Breaking but- news too, Graham. And we're, we're great to have you here for some breaking news. Josh Ooh. Norris wearing a regular colored jersey. That's what practice. you like to hear. So I, could I, we I, see a Brady boost in points after you mention it, getting his line mate back? All right, book it. Look at it. Look against, it. Flor- against Florida. He's getting a two point night. Two point night for Brady Kachuk. Lock Brady it Kachuk. in. Betonline.net. I, mean, I mean, last game they scored eight <laughs> goals against the Panthers, so it's pretty likely Brady's going to get two points with eight goals being scored. Right? Bring us, yeah. bring us Spencer Knight. On <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, that would be great. And hey. While we're on the talks of goaltending, Graham, I got a last question for you here. How do you feel about the Ottawa Senators goaltending situation? And look, Forsberg's probably their biggest trade piece right now, but are you in a situation where you're comfortable trading him for a third round pick? Let's just call it conservative third round pick, you know, something that's not going to be monumental and helping you. And it's not going to help you right away. And are you comfortable enough next year going into it with Murray and Gus as your tandem? It's a hard question. It's a hard yeah. question because, I mean, it's night and day with our goaltending this year, obviously. Uh, I, I'm still pretty confident with, with Murray as our first. Uh, Even with the health concerns, like, do you feel like it's a point where you need a stable veteran backup to come in and play games? Yeah, definitely. So I, I would keep Forsberg this season. I wouldn't okay. trade him. I'd extend him one or two years. And then okay. that's when you you, you tr- find a, some trade bait for him. All right. I, I, I'm a big Gus guy. I love Gus. He, he's got a, he's gotten the short stick a little bit this year with uh, going all over the place. He hasn't really yeah. gotten tough into a, a good schedule. Right. So yeah. I, I, and when he does, he, unfortunately he's had some kind of uh, crummy outings, but that, that's just like, it's, he's a young guy. He's a yeah. young goaltender. He's not going to do well if he doesn't, play consistently right so i i yeah i i keep him extend him and then trade him with that uh like a a solid contract all right so were you swearing at me and punching your steering wheel when i was on team protect dax over over gus last spring (laughs) no you know what everybody's allowed to have their opinion even if it's wrong (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right graham i got i got two final uh, quick ones here we'll do it in rapid fire and again appreciate you joining us everyone go give him a follow on twitter at sends shul healing underscore and you can find it in the in the tweet when we put out the episode as well at send central next time the sends win a playoff game 
Will Matt Murray be the goalie? And will DJ Smith be the head coach? Oh, I think DJ's sticking around. Okay. Um, right. That's for Matt Murray. I mean, like. Two more years after this year. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm going to say yes. All nice. Right. Yeah. If it's not next year, it has to be the next year. All right. Boom. Good Perfect. A little positivity to end yeah. off of, Graham. Really appreciate you jumping on with us. Great chatting with you. And we're going to do it again down the road too, buddy. Cheers, boys. Uh, happy to be here and love to come back sometime. Stick taps to Graham for joining us. Really appreciate having him on. Great stories. Great guy. And we'll be sure to have him on again later down the road. We also have some fun things happening in the Hopper Pillsy, including potentially some Send Central Citizen t-shirts. We got a lot to give out now. That he was probably, How many do you think we've done? Over 50? Over 50 for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We got to get back and find out how many because we need to celebrate the 100th. We need to celebrate more milestones on this show. But <laughs> there might be a milestone or two coming up in Belleville as the B Sens are still hunting their, their way into a playoff spot right now. Big game tonight against the Hartford Wolfpack. And that's a road game for Belleville. And we know that those haven't always gone the same way as they have at CAA Arena this year. So what are you hoping to see out of Belleville, they're without Mad Sogard, still out with an upper body injury, still without Igor Sokolov, who's out with a shoulder injury. And, well, they're going to have to make do with the guys that are in the lineup. Yeah, so it sounds like Philip Gustafson's going to get the start tonight. So that's good to get Gus in some game action here. And the Hartford Wolfpack, not a team Belleville sees a lot. They're in a different division. And they're in a similar spot. I think they're second or third in their division. A couple more wins than Belleville. But... I was looking through their lineup, Ross, and I don't really recognize a lot of these prospects. And I guess, like, if you look at the Rangers, their prospect system is they're all playing up in New York already. Right. So this is a situation where maybe you can uh, catch catch a team that's not quite as stacked as other teams in Belleville's division. And I'm hoping they can get a W here with Philip Gustafson in net. I don't see why not. And as long as Michael Delzato gets a point, there you go. Gus needs to have a big game tonight. Like yeah. the numbers, it's continuing the trend, Pilsy. Where so he's funny, unbelievable, and maybe maybe that's even a little bit passe because yeah. that hot streak kind of you know came and went for Phil Gusson, but he just can't seem to put consistent efforts together at the AHL level. Like I'm I'm pulling up his stats right now, but what what do you think it is? Like is it really that much of how the games played? Like three goals on 29 shots, like. Okay, that's all right, but they lose 4 1, so not like he's going to get the win either way. And that's the only real game he got. He played 11 or played one period or less against Syracuse a few games ago, but I want to see a couple of consistent efforts. He was great in, the, in his last NHL start. So do you think that momentum can potentially carry down? I really think, and I've mentioned this before with Gus, it's not so much the changing in leagues, Ross, because Gus has done that. He has, right. he's the most uh, franchise most wins for Belleville. So, yeah. 34 <laughs> 37 oh um so he spent time down there right like he he knows what to expect from the ahl and now you can actually say that ahl's decor or belleville's decor sorry is pretty good like there there's two blue chip prospects there's an nhl veteran down there and then the rest of the guys are solid whereas in past years belleville's decor had been atrocious like call-ups yeah. guys from the echl um college guys that are just in ottawa's backyard like all these kinds of things were happening so i don't really see that as the excuse or the problem ross it's he's just bouncing around so much. It's so hard to get your bearings when you're constantly being moved and you don't get to be in one place with one team, one league for enough time. So I still think, look, I don't want to make excuses for the guy, but I think that plays a big part of it. The Hartford Wolfpack are third in their division. They're 25, yeah. 16 and four. So that's a team that you're hoping that you can come in here and compete with because teams are teams are getting points right if Belleville loses tonight all of a sudden Syracuse in points percentage which is how the playoffs will be decided this year they all they jump and then Belleville's back in six so it's a huge game for Belleville tonight and we'll be following along at send central on Twitter all right Pilsy we've been kind of putting it off because it was kind of what we expected but the start was fun hey the send scoring twice on their first two shots last night they ultimately lose 5-2 to Tampa in a game where well, you pay for stars for a reason. And Kucherov, yep. Point, Stamkos, all getting goals in this game. Like, I mean, 
you can't you can't draw the start up any better, but you can't really expect much from the last 45 minutes either. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty fair. Like the Sens, if they were going to have any success in this game, they needed to jump out to a lead. Like if if they started chasing right away, the game was already over. I mean, they were up 2 nothing, and I still wasn't, wasn't that confident uh, that they were going to be able to pull this one out as time went on. But they did play a good first period. They were dominant there. And then the third period at the end, they had a flurry of shots uh, to try to at least claw back a little bit. But it's just the middle of this game when Tampa decides to take over. There's just not enough when a team's dealing with stomach flu and going up against a fully healthy Stanley Cup contending team. And I think the Sens tried to get into this game physically. We saw Brady was hot all night looking for a scrap, looking to settle any kind of scores. And Alex Formanton got in the mix. Nice fight with uh, Shirelli, which he, uh, I would say Formanton definitely got the better of him there. And then Josh Brown mixing it up with Pat Maroon. So there was a lot of physicality in this game. The Sens saying, hey, we can't out-talent them. Maybe we can out-grit them. But just wasn't meant to be this time. No, it wasn't. Do you think if they play that same style against Florida, they'll have a better chance? I mean, they're not going to out-talent the Florida Panthers either. So, yeah, I would say definitely they're going to have to play a hard-style game here. Getting Josh Norris back is such a blessing. Oh, so, at least at least that will help things because he's the kind of guy that can just carry the puck into the zone and rip one past the goalie, and that's an easy-peasy goal. So, hopefully we can see him doing something like that. And DJ Smith did mention that they thought Norris was good to go a couple I feel comfortable with him being in this game. Part of me thought, Ross, that they would give him this game off, another tough opponent in Florida, and then wait for Arizona, an easier matchup, and you get a little more legs for a back-to-back. But they had already done the precautionary, okay, you're good to go, but we're going to wait. So I'm fine to throw him in here. Let's go. Yeah, really exciting. We're going to have a full preview on tomorrow's show. One final note before we go, though, DJ Smith mentioning Chris Tierney, who we believed was just a part of the 10 guys who had the flu and was going to just miss a few games. Turns out it's a lower body injury pillsy for Chris Tierney and he's gone back to Ottawa. So he'll be out for the rest of the road trip and be reevaluated in a week. Yeah. I mean, that's too bad because these are crucial times for Chris Tierney to try to boost his trade stock here. But if it was going to happen, at least it's happening when you get two of your uh, top nine centers back and you're not desperate for sentiment. So that's okay, I guess. Yeah, it's not like he'd been really producing as a top nine centerman at all uh, in the last while as well here. If I pull up his career or sorry, his splits for the season, like again, it's it's so wild how it just mirrored last year, right? Where he has so many goals right off the bat in February. He actually had five points in 12 games. Yeah, he he was sneaky in February. Yeah, sneaky. I mean, just one goal in his last lot of games. A lot of games. One goal in his last lot of games. More than 30. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, you're looking at a guy who maybe hasn't had the impact he did in the first couple of years, but you never want to see a guy out of the lineup with injury. So we hope that that heals up quick. And you're right. Maybe he can play his way onto a contending team, go on a run, rejuvenate his career. But for a guy with uh, back injuries in the past and maybe not the fastest guy to begin with, it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle, but he's making 4 million bucks this year. So you can't feel too, too bad for him from that standpoint. Yeah, that's the thing. I think it would be best for everyone if Chris Tierney moves on. I mean, he's probably ready to. Yeah. I mean, he's leading the team in, in games played um, all time, all time. Where do you think he sits among all? Let's end the show with a little trivia, which I all feel like time? We're, we're mixing in a little bit more and more here. Yeah. All time. Where do you think Chris Tierney is uh, in games played for the Ottawa Senators? Can you tell me how many games he's played? I don't know yes. off the top of my head. 258 games for the Senators. It's got to be somewhere around 50 if there's something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'll close. say 50. 50. Close. Yeah, yeah, close. 45th. Okay, um, he's, yeah. He, he's sandwiched between Philip Kuba, who's played 261, <laughs> nice. and Colin Greening, who's played 256. Jared Cowan at 249. Oh, and God. just to complete the, the linear thing there, Brady Kachuk sits in 48th right now with 247 games. Of course, Thomas Shabbat, the active leader in games played for the Ottawa Senators. His 301 games are three behind Mark Mathot for 32nd on the all-time list. Hey, that's going to add by one tomorrow when the Senators play the Florida Panthers. Pilsy, any last thoughts here before we go for today? 
let's just hope uh, we see Spencer Knight. How about that? That would be a, a nice thing for Florida to do. Hey, they love putting their backups in. He's now their third stringer, though. They brought in the guy from Colorado, Johansson, right? Yeah, is he even up with the team right now? I, I don't think he's up with the team, no. He's not? No. It's so. either going to be Sergei Bobrovsky or Jonas Johansson. Was was Johansson in goal for that wild game in Colorado? I think Ottawa lost 7-5 that game. I think so. I don't think it was I gotta, Kemper. No, I don't think it was Kemper either. I'm pulling it up right now. Let's see. He, oh, he, he... What? He made <laughs> one He made one save and played two minutes and 25 seconds in that game. Huh? Weird. I don't remember how that happened. Me neither. That's very strange. It was Darcy Kemper, and... Kemper must have gotten pulled. Kemper let in five goals on 20 shots in that game. Yeah, so, yikes. anyways, maybe they'll play Jonas Johansson. I think it's more likely they'll go with Sergei Bobrovsky based on the Sens putting up an eight spot on them the last time they played. Yeah. We'll get into a preview of that game tomorrow. Hope you enjoyed our Sen Central Citizen. Again, if you want to be put on the list to be a Sen Central Citizen, shoot us a message on Instagram, lockedon.senators, or on Twitter at Sen Central. For today, we say goodbye. We'll chat tomorrow. For Brandon Pillar, I'm Ross Levitan. Thank you for listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast, where we've got your team every day.